the best way to learn a language, immersion, living where the language is spoken and using it every day. But if that's not in the cards for you this year, you can still learn a language the second best way, and that's with Babbel. Be a better you in 2024 with Babbel, the science-backed language learning app that actually works. Don't pay hundreds of dollars for private tutors or waste hours on apps that don't really help you speak the language. Babbel's quick 10-minute lessons are handcrafted by over 200 language experts to help you start speaking a new language in as little as three weeks. Babbel's designed by real people for real conversations. Babbel's tips and tools are approachable, accessible, rooted in real-life situations, and delivered with conversation-based teaching so you're ready to practice what you've learned in the real world. For instance, I've been using Babbel's convenient courses to help me learn basic conversational skills in German while I'm getting ready for a little trip I'm planning. It's not a language I'd ever studied before, but I find the lessons really easy and kind of like hand-holding me through learning a completely new language to me. And it's reassuring to know that with the help of Babbel, I'll be able to greet people, order food, and ask for directions without having to consult language apps. While I'm in Deutschland, I'm still learning. Studies from Yale, Michigan State University, and others continue to prove Babbel is better. One study found that using Babbel for 15 hours is equivalent to a full semester at college. Babbel has over 16 million subscriptions sold. Plus, all of Babbel's 14 award-winning language courses are backed by their 20-day money-back guarantee. Here's a special limited-time deal for our listeners. Right now, get up to 60% off your Babbel subscription, but only for our listeners, at babbel.com slash vulgar. Get up to 60% off at babbel.com slash vulgar, spelled B-A-B-B-E-L dot com slash vulgar. Rules and restrictions may apply. Hi, this is Rob Benedict. And I am Richard Spate. We were both on a little show you might know called Supernatural. It had a pretty good run. 15 seasons, 327 episodes. And though we have seen, of course, every episode many times, we figured, hey, now that we're wrapped, let's watch it all again. And we can't do that alone. So we're inviting the cast and crew that made the show along for the ride. We've got writers, producers, composers, directors, and we'll of course have some actors on as well, including some certain guys that played some certain pretty iconic brothers. It was kind of a little bit of a left field choice in the best way possible. The note from Kripke was, he's great, we love him, but we're looking for like a really intelligent Duchovny type. With 15 seasons to explore, it's going to be the road trip of several lifetimes. So please join us and subscribe to Supernatural then and now. Hello and welcome to Vulgar History Season 3. My name is Anne Foster, and this is a feminist women's history comedy podcast. And what that means is that we talk about women from history in a sometimes whimsical way. The title of the show is Vulgar History, so there's going to be some um, irreverency. There's going to be some swear words. Every time I like go to record an episode, I think to myself, is this, try really hard, Anne. Try to not have swear words so you don't have to choose the explicit rating when you're posting it but guess what I always get a little worked up and there's always there's always a little swearing so vulgar history that that's your content warning I guess although I guess chances are you already saw there was an explicit warning on this episode because chances are I'm going to swear at some point so the first season of this podcast the theme was well-behaved women don't make history podcasts and we're looking at some lesser known women from history mostly from British history I should side note, most of what I talk about on this podcast is British history because that is a research interest of mine. It's also when you're looking at women's history, kind of a place where a lot of research has already been done. Um, I'm not able to dive into various, you know, primary sources and archives and things. I'm relying a lot on what books have already been written by other people and where we're looking at women's history. The women who are written about the most tend to be queens, and in terms of Western history, um, those queens tend to be British, and so that's where where I've wound up doing a lot of my researching. And so the first season, Well Behaved Women Don't Make History podcasts, the second season 
how did I phrase it? It was called um, Women Leaders and the Men Who Whined About Them. So there we were. That was a bit more international in scope, but we were just looking at various women who were uh, leaders of various nations and how men got really pissed off about it. And then the pandemic happened, and I did some pandemic super specials looking at the history of diseases and things, and that leads us all to where we are today, which is season three. And the topic for this season is going to be much more uh, specific. Well, not not that the other ones didn't have specific topics. It's just this one is going to be geared towards one specific person. In a way, well, you see. So the theme for this season is how to lose a queen in nine days, aka the Jane, Lady Jane Grey scenario. So if you're listening to this, I'm guessing you have some sort of interest in history, potentially British history. And so you may or may not know the Lady Jane Grey is known as the Nine Days Queen. She was an English noblewoman and sort of the Queen of England and Ireland, asterisk from July 10th until July 19th, 1553, a.k.a. nine days. How she became the queen and why and was she really the queen and what happened after is complex. It's a weird story. And the fact that she was queen for such a short amount of time means that a lot of the history about how she got there in the first place has been sort of not swept under the rug because like we know about it. But just in the sense of people kind of didn't want to dwell on it. It was sort of embarrassing. So we're going to be looking at the various different women who led to that situation, to Jane herself, and then to what happened afterwards. So we're going to be, there'll be nine episodes this season, unless, you know, I give myself the right to do more or less if I change my mind. So we're going to be looking at the nine women who... Her specific um, ancestors and women who lived at the same time as her or a little bit after to just kind of really get a big picture understanding of what the situation was and how and why she was kind of queen for nine days. So how to lose a queen in nine days is the season's theme. So a lot of these stories, basically all of these stories are going to overlap with each other in some way because we're looking at people who are around when Jane Grey, the whole Jane Grey scenario happened, people who were there after. So it's kind of like the, it's kind of like if you've read Jasmine Guillory's romantic comedy novels, which if you haven't, I super recommend them, especially in these pandemic times. They're just like escapist fantasy. They're wonderful. So it starts with the wedding date and the next one's called The Proposal. There's five of them right now. Anyway, those books, like the first book, someone who's not the main character then becomes the main character in the second book, and then someone who's a supporting character in the second book becomes the main character in the third book, and that sort of thing is kind of what's going to be happening with the season of this podcast, where we're going to look at one woman's story, and then someone who I mentioned there, the next episode we're going to look at her story, and a lot of them overlap because these people often lived at the same time as one another. And that's what we're doing in this season, and I hope that these stories of things that happened centuries ago to a bunch of white ladies in England will help us all get our minds off of the current nightmarish dystopia in which we all live in the year 2020. So, oh, and then also the way that this podcast works is at the end of each episode, I I score the day's heroine on our scandalicious score. So there's four categories. They are scandaliciousness which is kind of how juicy were any scandals that this person was involved with. And then the scheminess, which is how much did that person take charge of their own life and actions? And did they come up with schemes and were they good schemes? Uh, Then we look at also the significance. So what were the long lasting repercussions of this person's life and decisions and choices? Sometimes that means like, were they the ancestor of someone who later became important or did they influence something that affects us still today that sort of thing and then the final category in the score is the sexism bonus which is sort of an anti-bonus but effectively how much did living under the patriarchy affect their life in in horrible ways and kind of the more it affected them the higher their score is in that and so we have over the course of our last several our last two seasons, so we're running this scandalous scale. Let me just consult so I can give you 
an update for how we're doing. So currently, at the very top of the Scandalicious scale, from having done two seasons, and this being the third season, so the highest that anyone gets, like the highest total possible score would be a 40. And the highest right now we have is Joanna of Naples with a 33. Um, Agrippina is behind her with a 31. Empress Matilda and Juana the First of Castile both have 30. And then in fifth place is Queen Anne with 29.5. So no one has yet to score a perfect 40. I can't even imagine the amazing story that that would be. And the way that this scale works too is that someone could be like super scandalous, extraordinarily schemy. Um, have faced all kinds of sexism, but then their significance might be lower. Or someone with really high significance maybe wasn't as scandalicious. And that's why there's four different elements to it, because we want to judge everybody against the same same scale. With all that being said, um, welcome back to this little podcast. And today we are starting with a woman whose name is Mary Tudor. And I just need to clarify a couple things such as who is she so there's a famous woman who is also a tutor whose name is mary who is england's queen mary the first aka bloody mary that's not who we're talking about today there's also mary queen of scots who lived at the same time that is also not who we're talking about today today we're talking about a woman whose google search results can be very um hard to parse because she, her name is Mary Tudor, and there's just other people called Mary and Mary Tudor at the same time. But who this person is, is the baby sister of King Henry the Eighth, and she is also the grandmother, asterisk. I permit myself the ability to correct myself later. I think grandmother, yes, grandmother, of Lady Jane Grey. So this is where the whole Lady Jane Grey scenario effectively begins because the whole thing with Lady Jane Grey is that at the time and we're going to have like a whole Lady Jane Grey episode don't you worry about it there's going to be nine episodes this season they're all talking about it but in as short as I can explain it there was a period of time in English history where everyone was like who will be the next king and or queen and they started looking Henry VIII's children for various reasons were not possibilities and so they were like, well, what about the children of Henry VIII's sisters? So Henry VIII had an older sister called Margaret, who was married to the King of Scots. And then her granddaughter is Mary, Queen of Scots. And that's where that whole challenge comes from. But the thing is that Henry VIII had put in his will that Margaret's children could never inherit the throne because things went back and forth between England and Scotland and Catholics and Protestants for a really long time. And at the time that Henry VIII made his will, Margaret's children were both Scottish and Catholic. And Henry did not want them to take the throne. So in his will, he was like, hi, I know that God chooses the king, etc. But I'm pretty sure God wouldn't want Catholic Scottish people on the throne. So let's just bypass Margaret's children and instead look at the descendants of my little sister, Mary. And that's where Jane Grey comes into it. But again, I'm going to clarify that in the whole next nine episodes. Today, we're just looking at who is who is Mary Tudor? aka the other Mary and that's who we're looking at today so Mary Tudor today's hero was born in March 1496 we don't know the specific date because nobody bothered to write it down which happened a lot in history even to people like her who was literally the daughter of the king and queen Um, her parents were Henry the seventh and Elizabeth of York. So her grandmother was Elizabeth Woodville, if you know who that is. Then you do. Um, And you know that she's from a very cool background. So she was born in March 1496. Uh, Nobody cared to write down her date. Personally, and I don't know a lot about astrology, but what I do know a lot about her is Aries, because I am an Aries. And that's the only thing in astrology I ever pay attention to because that's very Aries of me to not care about the other signs. But I feel like I feel like she's got a strong Aries energy, so I'm gonna theorize she was born maybe towards the end of March. That's my headcanon. Anyway, so she was the fourth child born to the king and queen. So in order, the king and queen's children were Arthur, 
who's the oldest son. And then there was Margaret, who's the oldest daughter. And then there is Henry, who is the second son. And then Mary is a little baby of the family. So when Mary was around five years old, a Spanish princess came to town who was going to marry Arthur, the oldest brother. That Spanish princess is Catherine of Aragon, who you might have heard of for various other reasons, or maybe you haven't, and whatever, learn about her. Here we go. So Catherine of Aragon had grown up with a bunch of sisters of her own. She came to town to sort of cement this like Spanish-English alliance by marrying Arthur. And so they all got along with each other, the four Tudor siblings, and Catherine to sort of hang out together in, in for a few months in royal court with this sort of youthful energy. Arthur, Catherine, Margaret, Henry, and Mary, who is the littlest. So sort of like a Von Trapp family scenario is what I picture. Um, then, because it's Tudor history, um, a series of tragedies would happen because that is just the curse of this family. So... The first thing that happened is that Arthur died. So this was pretty shocking to everybody. Uh, Catherine had come over from Spain to marry him, and now he was dead. Oh, they got married. Then he died. Uh, But still, she was a widow, and she never got pregnant with him, so it's just kind of like, what are we going to do with Catherine? And that's what the first season of the Stars TV show The Spanish Princess talks about, with some extra gossipy bits, if that interests you. So this put everything into a sudden crisis. It meant that Henry, who had been training to become a priest, was suddenly going to have to become the king. So they had to change what kind of schooling he was getting and that sort of stuff. Catherine was just sort of abandoned. Mary at this point was five years old. So she's just kind of like, her brother just died. Sad, tragic, etc. Um, And then shortly after that, Mary's mother, who had been pregnant, she died. She gave birth and then died. And the baby also died. That would have been a daughter named Catherine. So again, just putting ourselves in the shoes of Mary. So her oldest brother died. The kingdom is in chaos because he was the next king. Then her mother dies. Her father took that really hard. Um, They all took it really hard, but her father really did. And then just after that, her older sister, Margaret, was sent to Scotland to marry the king of Scots. And basically they never saw each other ever again. Henry, um, so Henry and Mary had been pretty close they're just five years apart in age and they were kind of like the second the second son and the second daughter so they were sort of like the two that people didn't care about as much and so they got to hang out together there was less sort of pressure put on them but then suddenly henry has to be the king and so he was sent off for king training lessons and catherine of aragon was put in sort of a house arrest while everybody figured out what to do with her so It went from having these like months of fun young people hanging out together to Mary being kind of abandoned by literally everybody. And she was sent off to live in her own household away from everybody else. So that's a lot to happen to someone who is by this point six years old. And so perhaps because of the emotional toll of all of the above, or maybe just from the general health issues of living in 16th century England, Mary became ill. She was ill a lot as a child, um, but she did not die. She got better and was schooled up in all the skills required of being a princess. So she was taught languages, music, dancing, embroidery, a pretty decent education, frankly, um, for anyone at this time. By the time she was a teenager... Uh, She was known for being beautiful. She's described as being lovely in both personality as well as in looks. She was said to be one of the most beautiful princesses in Europe at this time. And nobody really knows what she looks like, but we do know that from people's descriptions, she had dark red hair and a fair complexion and light colored eyes. When she was 10 years old, she was sort of auditioned to maybe be betrothed to the son of Juana the Mad of Castile, who you know if you listen to that podcast about her last season. So 10 years old, Mary was brought out to dance and to play the lute and clavichord for a visiting delegation from Castile to kind of be like, look at what a great wife I'd be. I can play clavichord. And she did well in the sense of the betrothal was soon arranged between her and Charles of Castile. But shortly after all of this got sorted, 
And again, she's 10 years old at this point. Um, Henry VII passed away, her father. And so her brother Henry became King Henry VIII, which at this point, again, I honestly just like stars TV show, The Spanish Princess is, I enjoy it. I enjoy the show. Um, and I recommend it just because so much of the Henry VIII lore is about him being old and like having all the wives and all that stuff. But when it started out, like if you're just like in the present moment of him becoming king, he was this young, what, like 15 year old ish. Um, and he was tall and handsome and everybody was just like, oh man, look at this new tall, handsome king we get. This is great. He married Catherine of Aragon, who had been living in limbo ever since Arthur died. And so that was great. And everybody loved Catherine. It was this really exciting new energy. Everyone was really excited about it. So Henry VIII, like to me, and I'm assuming to you, but maybe it's just me. I just think like, ugh, gross, my arch nemesis, the worst. But at this point, he was just like this king. Everyone was kind of excited about this fresh new energy. Um, For Mary, this was probably again sad because her father had just died but also like her beloved brother was the king um catherine was back in her life she got to hang out with catherine again things were good um but then henry decided so this castilian marriage arrangement had been made but henry decided you know what i don't i think we could do better i don't think we need to uh mayor her off to the son of of one of the Juana La Loca of Castile, what we're going to do is we're going to marry Mary to the King of France. So the thing about this is that the King of France was 53 years old, um, and Mary was, you would assume, based on how much stuff had happened to her, she was 35 at this point, but in fact she was 17. So Henry decided what he was going to do is marry his 17-year-old sister to the 53-year-old French king, Louis the Twelfth, who is also very ill. So like nothing the matter with being a fifty three year old king. But if you're like seventeen and you're told and she would have been raised knowing like her the whole point of her life was to marry whoever her family decided to marry her off to for like national alliance reasons, but one can imagine she would be a little disappointed to learn that she's gonna marry a fifty three year old French man who had gout. Um, but she was also extra disappointed because she was already in love with somebody else. And that was Charles Brandon. So if you watch the Tudors TV show, which whatever channel that was on, it's streaming somewhere. Um, Charles Brandon is played on that TV show by Henry Cavill pre-Superman. So just like young Henry Cavill before he got super bulky. So just like peak Henry Cavill. So, and Charles Brandon, Henry VIII's best friend slash super handsome. And let me just see, he was not that much older than her. Um, wait, he was born in 1484. She was born in, yeah, 1484. So he's just like 10 years older than her. So, I mean, still older, like she's 27. He's or she's 17, he's like 27. That's like, in these days, bleh. But in those days, if your options are 53 or 27, like I'd go with Henry Cavill personally. So, and the thing is they were in love with each other, but secretly. So she had always been close with her brother Henry. And so she explained to him like, guess what? I don't want to marry the 53 year old French king. I'd rather marry your best friend, Charles Brandon, um, because I love him. And the thing is, at this point, love marriage was, like, not a thing royalty did in general. So Henry was like, um, no, like, I think we both know this. You've both been raised, like, the whole point of your life is to marry somebody, to make an alliance, and then have children, and then, like, help our dynasty continue forever, etc. Um, and so he said, no, you can't marry Charles Brandon. She's like, mm, sorry, I choose Charles Brandon. And then they had this big fight. So Henry refused to back down. Mary refused to back down. But the thing is, they both really loved and cared for each other in a sibling way. And Henry really had a soft spot for her. So eventually she was able to sort of negotiate this sort of prenuptial agreement that said like, okay, if Mary married the 53-year-old French king, 
when he died, Mary would get to choose her own next husband. Henry wouldn't get to choose that. And Henry was like, mm, fine. I, I agree to that. And the thing is that the French king was sick. So Mary was probably thinking like, okay, I might be married to him for like a year, five years, whatever. Um, and when I'm done, I can marry Charles Brandon. So she agreed. And that negotiation had gone on for so long. By now she's 18 and she was put on a boat to sail across the English Channel <clears throat> to marry the French king. And one of the, she was sent along with ladies in waiting because she was a princess and that is how princesses traveled. One of her ladies in waiting was Anne Boleyn, who was probably sent along because Anne Boleyn had spent time in France. And so she, it's like, we're going to France. Like this makes sense. Let's send her to France. This is way before Henry and Anne were romantically involved. At this point, Anne Boleyn was just like a gorgeous lady in waiting with maybe a French accent. Um, the two of them did not get along. I'm not sure if something happened specifically on this journey or if Mary just like didn't like Anne Boleyn for various reasons, but the two of them did not get along. And this is just like a fun little foreshadowing moment. This is the sort of thing we're going to get a lot in the season where just people who become important later sort of like come into someone's life in this low key way and then they become important later on. So just stood out of the way. Mary did not like Anne Boleyn. Um, so she arrived in France and this is where we get most of the people's written descriptions of what she looks like. And no one in France was going to be like, and then the princess arrived and she was gross and everyone thought she was gross. But the way that they wrote like so effusively about the effect she had on people kind of speaks to, to what she was like in terms of charisma and appearance. Um, she was described as being gorgeous. Um, she was seen as graceful. She was well-mannered. She took your breath away. One chronicler wrote, quote, she is paradise. Um, her 53-year-old fiancé, Louis XII, described her as a nymph from heaven. She was apparently fun-loving, um, cheery, a whole lot of fun. Um, back when she was in England, she had enthusiastically taken part in dances and performances with Henry VIII and everybody else. So she was just like a good time. She was the whole package. She was smart. She was talented. She was lovely. She was beautiful. Um, when she first met Louis XII, apparently she blew him a kiss, which everybody was like, oh, mon dieu. So even though she didn't want to be there marrying this much older person, she like sold it. She was like, she was there. She showed up. She did her job as a Tudor princess to do this marriage alliance. And then less than three months later, the French king was dead. So, now, probably he had lots of health problems, including gout, and he probably died of health problems related reasons, but isn't it interesting to think that maybe she killed him? Um, some people thought that then. That's not just me trying to look for drama where there is none. Um, there were rumors that she was so young and gorgeous, um, and the king was so much older that maybe when they consummated the marriage, like her sexual appetite was so voracious that she had like fucked him to death. Um, I mean, such was her effect on people that they thought she was capable of that, which is like, I've saw that plot line on, I want to say, uh, murder she wrote where there's a thing where it seemed like they got married and then he died and it was a heart. No, it was like CSI or something. Anyway. So this is, the thought that a, a woman could fuck a man to death, especially if he's old, maybe has a heart condition, is possible. Um, again, on the Tudors, I'm pretty sure, I haven't watched it in a while, but I think they show her actively murdering him by, like, smothering him with a pillow. And those were rumors, too. And did she kill him? I mean, officially, no. But also, if she did, she would have been so good about it, we would never know it was her. So rumors spread just because people back then were gossipy and lived for drama. And whatever the reason, she had been Queen of France for less than three months. She did not get pregnant, which meant she had no ties to that country. If she was pregnant with, you know, the new heir to the throne, then she probably would have stayed there and been like Dowager Queen, etc. But she wasn't pregnant. Uh, the king was dead and she was able to go back to England or so she thought. Um, the thing is that the French custom at the time was the royal widows had to stay indoors for a month 
following the death of their husbands and like not talk to many people and just kind of that's how mourning worked so she wanted to just like if she could fly back to England I mean like she couldn't have flown obviously but I'm sure she just wished she could and marry Charles Brandon slash Henry Cavill but she had to stay indoors for months so she was just kind of going bananas while a whole bunch of people tried to figure out what to do with her so nobody obviously expected she'd be widowed so quickly uh the french royals wanted to find her a new french royal husband to keep up this english french alliance that was the whole reason why she was married to them in the first place um henry as well wanted to find her a new french husband for this alliance reason but people in England also knew that she was in love with Charles Brandon, and they knew that she had this special deal where she could marry whoever she wanted. And Charles Brandon already had a lot of power in England because he was King Henry VIII's best friend. His enemies didn't want him to marry Mary because they thought, well, that would give him even more power and influence, and we don't want him to have power and influence. So everybody was just like debating what are we going to do with her. And eventually Henry sent for her to be like, after the month was over of her just like staying inside going insane um henry said it's time to send her back to england and we can like figure what to do with her once she's back and he looked around and he's like but who can i trust to send to france to bring her back and well i feel like shouldn't he be able to trust anybody he's the king but no because everybody was scheming constantly and the person he picked was charles brandon this is an interesting choice and you might think did he do that knowing that the two of them would spoil or secretly get married? I think he chose Charles because um, it was his best friend. And he's like, if I can trust anyone to like bring her back and no funny business, it's Charles. So, or was he setting up Charles to see what he would do? I don't know. Fatefully, he chose Charles to go over and pick up Mary. He made Charles promise, don't do anything silly. Like, marry my sister and charles is like of course i won't marry your sister lol um but all of charles's and even if he went over there intending that like his promises meant nothing because mary had been indoors for 30 days after having been married to this man for three months and so she burst out of the room looking amazing with all of her charisma and was like guess what we're getting married right now let's elope it's happening and charles is like okay so they got married on March the 3rd, 1515, in sort of a secret wedding, and yet there were 10 guests there, including the new French king. So, like, not that secret. And the thing, so even though Mary had this agreement from Henry that she could choose her next husband, the agreement wasn't like she could just randomly choose him and get married without telling the king or getting the king's permission. It was basically treason to get married without telling the king about it, especially if you're related to the king like you're his sister but they both kind of felt like well if we get married it's the sort of like beg forgiveness instead of ask permission type scenario she just thought like we need to get married now or else Henry's gonna marry make me marry somebody else so let's just do this right now so she was a strong-willed person clearly and they're both hoping like okay Henry loves Mary so much as his like beloved baby sister and he loves Charles Brandon so much as his beloved best friend so let's just like get married um hopefully get pregnant as soon as possible so he can't do something awful like annul this marriage so they just like sail back to england as husband and wife um consummating their marriage presumably on that boat or whatever so they came back and to the surprise of nobody henry was really mad about this um secret marriage despite the fact that he had agreed that she could choose her second husband and also he had he was the one who sent charles there like what did he think would happen um and so all of charles brandon's enemies were like this is awful like you should arrest charles you should kill charles but henry's like "Mm, he's my best friend and mary's my baby sister and i love them both and so finally he was like okay and he decided to just punish them by giving them a fine but it was like a pretty small fine and they could pay it in small annual installments so not very inconvenient um he also said that mary had to repay her dowry back to him from her short-lived marriage to the French king and she was like deal and deal and then they're all best friends again so then Mary and Charles had a second wedding in England this time with Henry VIII among the guests everybody was happy about it one year later Catherine of Aragon had a daughter 
which is Henry's daughter. Um, and they named the new daughter Mary, probably in honor of Mary Tudor, his beloved sister slash Catherine's friend. So again, it's like now it's like the adult version of when they were kids and everything was great. Everything was great. Um, and again, you'd think like by now is Mary like 27, like a lot has happened to her, but no, she is 19 at this point. So by marriage, her new title was the Duchess of Suffolk, which is Charles Brandon's title. So she's sort of like dowager queen of France, but effectively the Duchess of Suffolk is her main thing. So she lived 19 years of life as chaos, tragedy, just like one thing after another happening around her and her not having much say in what happened to her own life. So she chose her husband, married him, and now she just wanted to chill out in the country with her new family for the rest of her life. Um, Charles came with a built-in step family for her. Um, He was raising two daughters from his first marriage, whose names were Mary and Anne, because that's the only names that existed for girls back then. Um, Mary being, even though she was 19, was like, okay, I'll be your stepmother, whatever. That's not weird. And she had some children as well. Um, She had two sons and two daughters, and we'll talk about them in a little bit because, remember, we're talking about her because she is the grandmother of Lady Jane Grey. So this is where that all starts. Anyway, as Philippa Gregory has shown us in her extremely um, plot twist filled dramatic fiction books, um, Tudor lives never end happily. There's always tragedy upon tragedy. In these lives, um, like you knew that one was coming here. Like, of course, it's a Tudor story. So in 1528, Mary Tudor was, she fell down with a sweating sickness, which I talked about on one of my pandemic special podcasts you can listen to a while ago. But it was this horrible disease that no one quite knows what it was, where you just like sweat and then, oh, I'm trying to remember. It's like, and then you suddenly feel like this horrible sense of dread and then you die it's gruesome and you die in like 24 hours or something. Again, listen to my podcast about that where I have more scientific information. Anyway, she fell sick. Remember, she was sick a lot as a child. She's just like a person who fell sick a lot, I guess. Um, so she's one of the people who came down with that, which was horrible, horrible for her. Um, she did get better, but um, this sort of weakened her immune system. So she just became more sickly after that. And at around this same time, um, Henry was busy trying to get his marriage to Catherine of Aragon annulled. Um, his, If you know the whole Henry VIII thing, then you know this bullshit part where he was just like, mm, well, basically because Catherine of Aragon had had their daughter Mary, but then she had so many children who died in infancy slash stillbirths, miscarriages. It was just like, oh, this poor woman, Catherine of Aragon. And eventually Henry was like, oh my God, she's so gross and old. She's like 38 years old. That was her age. That's, you know, and all the things about Catherine of Aragon where it's, she's this like menopausal old woman. And it's like, well, of course Henry wanted Anne Boleyn. She was like 38. Henry VIII, the worst. Um, Anyway, so Henry VIII wanted to annul his marriage to Catherine of Aragon, and his reasoning for that was because Catherine had been married to his brother Arthur before, and in the Bible it says, like, a woman can't marry two brothers or something. And Catherine was like, but I never had sex with him, and Henry's like, but did you? And then it was all bullshit. Whatever. He just wanted to marry Anne Boleyn because she was hot and he loved her. Um, Now, remember, Mary had never liked Anne Boleyn for mysterious reasons. And Mary was also a big, had always been a friend of Catherine of Aragon, and so she supported Catherine. So this really got between the brother and sister at this point. There's also the whole thing where Henry was going to have to, like, when the Pope wouldn't let him annul his marriage to Anne Boleyn, then he um, separated England from Catholic religion slash the Pope and started a new religion. Like, Mary was just not into any of this. She was like, remember when you were like, Mary, you can't get married for love. You're a royal. And now Henry was like doing all the stuff to Mary Anne Boleyn, who Mary already hated. So anyway, um, they had a big fight. Mary made no secret of the fact that she hated Anne Boleyn, thought she sucked, to the point that it became kind of an issue. Um, and then some Boleyn relatives were like, well, we need to teach her a lesson to not badmouth Anne Boleyn. And so what they did, the Boleyn relatives, allegedly, 
um, is that they murdered one of their household staff members. Um, as sort of like a look what we, if you don't stop bad nothing in Berlin, we'll kill more people or something. Um, Mary was like, well, fuck you. And she, st- she kept bad mouthing Anne Boleyn and as much as I like Anne Boleyn I also like Mary Tudor and I like that she never backed down from this um she was like the only person who could stand up to Henry VIII really the only woman certainly because it was his baby sister and he couldn't have her arrested etc and he just had this really soft spot for her but the Anne Boleyn of it all came between them they never had a chance to make up with each other because she was still kind of sick from re- remaining issues from the sweating sickness And then Mary Tudor died aged 37 because she had been the dowager. She'd been the queen of France for like almost three months, um, but also she was the king's sister and the daughter of the previous English king and a princess. So she had this massive state funeral. The funeral lasted for two days. It included a funeral procession where a hearse was pulled by six horses. Um, There was a hundred torchbearers. So her older daughter... Mary had two daughters, Frances and Eleanor, and her older daughter, Frances, was the chief mourner. Her stepdaughters, Anne and Mary, also came. Apparently, they pushed their way to the front of the procession to try and make themselves look more important, just as the coffin is being lowered into its crypt, which is just like the perfect little messy detail for the funeral of this woman whose life is so dramatic. And that was her death. So, her legacy... So she has these two daughters, Frances and Eleanor Brandon. Frances Brandon grew up and married a man named Henry Gray and had three daughters, Lady Jane Gray, Lady Catherine Gray, and Lady Mary Gray. That's where that part of the Lady Jane Gray story comes into play. So people were just like, who will be the next king and or queen for various reasons? We don't want Mary. We don't want Elizabeth. Henry himself removed his sister Margaret's children from the whole line of succession, so then they looked at, well, who were Mary Tudor's descendants? Both of her sons had died um, in infancy or early childhood, so she just had her and Charles Brandon, only had two children left, so Francis and Eleanor. So Mary Tudor was the sister of Henry VIII. Her daughter was Francis Brandon, who became Francis Gray, and that's the mother of Lady Jane Gray, and that's kind of where this all comes from. For interest's sake, her second daughter, Eleanor Brandon, married a man named Henry Clifford. They had a daughter named Margaret Clifford. Margaret Clifford married a man named Henry Stanley, and then they had a son named Ferdinando Stanley, and that's a whole other claim that we'll talk about in a different episode of this podcast. So you've got Mary, Tudor, Francis, Brandon, like her daughter Francis, that becomes a whole Gray family scenario. Her daughter Eleanor becomes a whole Clifford family scenario. And what I find interesting, well, I find this all interesting, but what I find sort of resonant is that through, so Mary Tudor's daughter, Francis, had three daughters. One of them was Lady Catherine Gray, who had some children. And if you keep following that lineage all the way down from Catherine Gray's children, you wind up on Elizabeth Bowes Lyon, a.k.a. Queen Elizabeth, the Queen Mum, so the mother of Queen Elizabeth I. So through, so in that way, um, Mary Tudor is an ancestor of today's current British family. And honestly, I mean, there's so much mess and drama in like every generation of every royal family. I just know a lot about the British one, particularly because of my research interest. But I feel like you can see a bit of the, the spirit of Mary Tudor in, for instance, Prince Harry these days. Anyway, um, there's a couple books about that involve Mary Tudor. The ones that I used for research for this were The Sisters of Henry VIII, The Tumultuous Lives of Margaret of Scotland and Mary of France by Maria Perry. And there's also quite a bit about Mary Tudor in the book Henry VIII, King and Court by Alison Weir. And... There's a couple of novels if you want to read even more about her. So there's a Philippa Gregory. There's always a Philippa Gregory book. Three Sisters, Three Queens talks about the three. I think the three queens in that are Mary Tudor, Catherine of Aragon, and I forget who the third one is. Anyway, but Mary Tudor is in that book. And then there's also Tony Riches is another author who writes a lot of Tudor era history, historical fiction. He has a book called Mary Tudor Princess. And so now it's exciting time to get into the scandalous scale 
for Mary Tudor. So the first category is scandaliciousness. So this is just like how juicy are any of the scandals that she was involved with? Like I give high marks if someone is involved with, for instance, murder or um, jewel theft or, or just things that are just like, oh my God, like really gossipy. So frankly, Mary Tudor, like what we know of the scandals that she was involved with, like the main one would be um, marrying Charles Brandon kind of in secret without permission and then coming back to England being like, surprise, we're married. It's all consummated. Um, The end, you can't do anything about it. And then also the whole rumor that did she fuck her husband to death? So it's not a lot of scandals, but the ones that are there are quite strong. So for that, I shall give her 7.5 out of 10. Um, The next category is scheminess, which is not just like anything that where she just takes control of what's going on and comes up with plans, whether they work or not, I would consider scheminess. So I think the fact that she's able to convince Henry to give her this prenuptial agreement where she can choose her second husband is a great scheme. Um, The fact that she convinced Charles Brandon to marry her without permission, a great scheme. Um... So again, not a lot of schemes, but the ones that she was involved with were impressive. So I'm going to give her a 7.5 for that as well. The next category is significance. And this is tricky with her because to me, she's very significant. What a cool story. But um, the fact that she's the, through her, the whole Jane Grey scenario happened. And Jane Grey, I feel like is, even though she's only queen for nine days, was like a significant event. So the fact that she's the ancestor of her she's the reason why Jane Grey got a claim to the throne is significant also who knows like the significance of just the fact that she married the French king and then didn't marry someone else French would have significance for English and French you know alliances and policies for ages because England and France were always at war I'm just going to give her 7.5 there as well I think 7.5 for significance and the final part is Uh, sexism bonus anti-bonus so like how much bullshit from the patriarchy did she have to put up with the fact that henry made her marry the king of france was some bullshit but then she fought back made her own marriage i don't know i feel like the sexism is like it sucks like no one's ever gonna get less than five but i'm just gonna give her five because that's kind of standard issue bullshit so what does this come to 26, 27, 27.5 for Mary Tudor. So that is, that puts her where? I'm just looking at the list here. I mean, it's good. It's a high score. She's there up in the top-ish. And I think this is a fair spot for her. Like she had some schemes, but not a lot. The people who are above her are people like Cleopatra, who had a lot of schemes. Agrippina, lots of schemes. So I think I think it's a fair score. So 27.5 is where we're starting off for our season three, episode one. Mary Tudor, a cool person. I enjoyed learning about her. And I hope you enjoyed listening to this so you can learn about her too. I wanted to mention, so the the theme for this season is Jane Grey, like the Jane Grey thing. But of course, the actual name of the season is How to Lose a Queen in Nine Days. And I have to credit my friend Alison Epstein, who queen of puns for helping me come up with that amazing name and i would just like to shout out that she is also an author Alison epstein has her debut novel is coming out in january 2021 it's called a tip for the hangman and it is a historical fiction novel about christopher marlowe who was a playwright in the tudor era he was shakespeare's sort of rival more importantly to people who are listening to this this novel is christopher marlowe becomes a spy and then he has to like spy on mary queen of scots for queen elizabeth all of our ladies are in this and the book sounds amazing and it comes out in january and i'll put information about it in the show notes so thank you allison for the suggesting the excellent name for the season of this podcast and i'll just remind you about all the things because we haven't we haven't had a chance to talk like this in a long time so In the show notes, you'll find information with all these links as well. But just so you know, if you would like to support this little podcast slash me on Patreon, it's at patreon.com slash Anne Foster Writer. 
and that's where you can find some if you sign up for the patreon there's some behind the scenes information you get you get early access to some content and also i have many episodes there called so this asshole where i talk about men who bother me from history and i put those there because otherwise i would get much too into it here on this podcast and we can talk about the women because i'd be too busy screaming about how much i hate these men so you can get the mini episodes there on my patreon this little podcast we're on instagram at vulgar history pod on twitter at vulgar history um we have merch which is at teespring so if you go to teespring.com slash stores slash vulgar history you can find our merch i'm going to be putting up some stuff for this season it will be hilarious and amazing and also there's some non-medical face masks there if you want a face mask with francis howard on it saying masks on tits out that's where you go to buy that sort of thing and then also i like to mention bookshop.org which is a website that where you can get books that also through them they support independent bookstores i have a list there of all the books that i have mentioned on this podcast and the ones that i use for research purposes so if anyway that's in the show notes um, bookshop.org and that's it for this episode i'm really excited to be back doing this podcast these nine episodes are going to be really interesting there's a lot of there's some bullshit coming up there's some stuff i'm really mad about that happened to some of these women Um, And I'm glad to get to yell about it with you and we can all talk about it after because half the reason I do this podcast is because these are stories I just want to tell people who are interested in them and you're listening to it and that means you're someone who's interested. So I would love to continue the conversation on Twitter or Instagram or whatever. So I will talk to you all next time. Tits out, masks on. See you next time. Welcome to the small town of Chinook, where faith runs deep and secrets run deeper. In this new thriller, religion and crime collide when a gruesome murder rocks the isolated Montana community. Everyone is quick to point their fingers at a drug-addicted teenager, but local deputy Ruth Vogel isn't convinced. She suspects connections to a powerful religious group. Enter federal agent V.B. Loro, who has been investigating a local church for possible criminal activity. The pair form an unlikely partnership to catch the killer, unearthing secrets that leave Ruth torn between her duty to the law, her religious convictions, and her very own family. But something more sinister than murder is afoot, and someone is watching Ruth. Chinook, starring Kelly Marie Tran and Sanaa Lathan. Listen to Chinook wherever you get your podcasts. Ah, the web tool. Those that both creators and were created by the threads disentangle from the fringes to feast on the very thing that spawned them. What's that to me? This is how you deal with me! No! Do not (laughs) harm my children! Oh, you lost a feather. Can I keep it? No, you can't force me to! Do you know what lies within nothing? Rocket is in trouble, Akasa! Can can we turn on the windshield remotely? No! She could lose her job as Nakasar. I don't fear Vehar. No, but you fear me. If you intend to trick me, I will not hesitate to sever the oath bond entirely. Why didn't you help me? Coward! I don't have a parachute! I don't like free falling! Counterbalance, a high fantasy audio drama. Season 2, coming 15th of October 2023. Learn more on trilunas.com. I'm Laura Cathcart-Robbins, and I'm the host and creator of Only One in the Room podcast. Every week, my co-host Scott Slaughter and I invite you to join us for an hour and lose yourself in someone's incredible Only One story. We talk to the realest of real people dealing with issues like infertility, addiction, human trafficking, and body shaming. Oh, and we want to be fair, so we talk to some celebrities, too. Oscar winners, New York Times bestselling authors, supermodels, and even the most decorated U.S. Winter Olympian. Everyone is invited to share their only one story with our listeners. This podcast is for anyone who has ever felt alone in a room full of people, which is to say that this podcast is for everyone. Download Only One in the Room wherever you listen to podcasts today.